Hi, um, I'm Elizabeth Thompson, and I'm a full-time artist. Yeah, I, I do, I like beauty, but there is, does need to be a little bit of edge as well. And, um, and as Greg was saying, the cellular memory, the connections are also a sort of my memory of things and how when I'm working, you know, there are threads running through my practice. And so every now and again, I'll go off into another tangent. And so it's, it's a sort of connectivity between all the works and how they've evolved. Um, and it's really fascinating to kind of draw those works together, um, even though they're from different, um, different chronology. I, um, it's really fascinating to see all those connections, um, even though the materials might be different and they, they could look different from each other, but there is still kind of um, a connection between things. And yeah, there's sort of like some things are a little spooky, I guess. Um, so there's always that, always that sort of little bit of a sort of sci-fi element, and, and it's the element too of my curiosity and my not knowing for sure about things. So I'm sort of kind of opening them up for um, for uh, experience of viewing and people taking something away with them, and hopefully kind of getting people to have um, maybe just be a little more observant and it's sort of like a kind of a hyper sensitivity to things. Um, and, you know, but you know, my mum was a science teacher and taught me chemistry and uh, biology. And I just, um, I just, there's such a wonderment, I think, uh, with, with science. And, you know, as you said, it's sort of hidden and we, it's become a little more visible now with COVID. <clears throat> um, and so people would never have seen, you know, so many cellular images before. And there is a little bit of a fear, but there's, Kind of a there is a beauty and um, all the pattern making and the I just think that that's so extraordinary and and certainly when I was um, looking through um, the microscopes uh, looking at moth wings or whatever um, I was really fascinated by if you re remove all the frames of reference you could be looking at a satellite image or you know you just didn't know what scale you're looking at and things are quite abstracted. With cellular memory three, so what sort of cell is that? And do we need to know that sort of information no, when you look at the show? Because I mean, there are all sorts no. of, in a way that to show that it's full of specimens. There are sort of, you know, there are all kinds of various species of leaves. There are microscopic images of um, bits of coral reefs. We've got bits of mm. cells. Um, mm. um, it's a show that we recognise things, but it is still full of mystery. But do you need to know, or is it quite good not to know? I mean, because it could be a green planet. Uh, uh, it could be That's an imaginative right. con construct, or it could be, you know, a, a bit of a cucumber. I don't know. Mm, but, yeah, I, I like the idea of this. This is kind of a very sort of pulsating thing, and it's almost like another sun, or, mm. you know. Um, and, yeah, so you're not quite sure then of the scale of this. But um, mostly I use plant cells, uh, but not necessarily, you know, you, of viruses and bacteria and things like that as well. Mm. Um, so, because I sometimes, if I you know, say exactly what something is, it could could have a little bit of a malevolence or something, or it all might influence how you see something. And I quite like the mm. fact that it is more open um, and, and open to interpretation. Yeah, um, I sort yeah. of see these things as being very much about <clears throat> like fields of energy. They sort of mm. project into the room. You know, I mean, it is a bit like. Well, I've mentioned before the creation of the world of an origin thing that is like an explosion, but but also your work through the use of this kind of imagery, the use of photographic source material, but then also using things like glass beads. You are doing all sorts of, I guess, kind of tricks, artistic tricks, to make these things kind of come alive and jump mm. out and, mm. and reach the viewer, aren't you? That's right. It's a bit like cooking, I guess. <laughs> you have an idea of, of the taste that you want or the sense of of things and um, and it's the same way with um, the way I work. I have, I have a bit of an idea of a sense of kind of where I want the work to be or how it to end up. Um, but, you know, sometimes I don't know for sure, but um, I know that certainly with the glass spheres that uh, the work becomes more active and changes with the light. And so you can never really quite grasp it. And that's mm -hmm. what I really like. Um, so I guess it sort of works sculpturally in that in that way, and has, as we found, with, if we isolate the works and don't have too many works around, then then they become more of that. The sort of experience of viewing becomes sort of heightened, and and they're sort of allowed to kind of 
breathe and pulse and, mm. um, as you said, have that kind of energy. Can you tell us just quickly, I mean, <clears> just the, how, what this is made of, just the layers. So, because mm. it's actually a three dimensional object, they're not paintings, they're not photographs. No. These are essentially relief sculptures. When you find these works in the gallery on the wall, they tend to project out from the wall. Although this is a, you know, a square or an almost square, um, it's actually the surface of it is undulating when you get close to it. You have to move mm. around the work to see this, but it's more like the human body than a, uh, than a, a flat piece of wall, mm. isn't it? Yes, I almost see them as somewhat like a sort of a filmic moment. And as Greg said, with the undulations, it keeps the, the work sort of moving. So it's 2D, 3D, and constantly on the move, really, even though it is a static um, image. But I work, with, I work with a number of people. And um, so my training was uh, printmaking. I did my master's in printmaking. And I, the works were photographically based on dioramas that I would make. And um, so they had a three-dimensional feel to them. And um, one critic thought, wanted to sort of go around behind the work to see if there was, you know, what, what was behind the work that it would sort of like went on and on and on. Um, kind of thing had an infinite depth, and with these, um, the panels are all um, routed wood. So I work with um, model makers, and they create these uh, computer files, and um, under my guidance. And so it's always a, a usually um, a formal grid that I work to, and it's based on um, yeah, sort of undulations of a, like a float button. Um, you get cities, you know, leather cities, but with vinyl you can stretch it more than you can in leather, and so you don't get the creases that you would with leather. So I've always kind of liked, you know, 50s, uh, 1950s, 60s kind of retro furniture, and so I'm sure all, all that sort of thing comes into play too. But so the all the panels, I, I like the idea of them being like a screen, and so they're sitting off the wall a little bit. Um, but they could also be kind of like a, a slot in the wall. So this is what you see on the outside of the building, you know, sort of life beyond. Mm -hmm. And um, so they float off the wall and I have a um, photographic image, which is applied. It's um, I work with a printer I've been following around for about the last 15 years. So I, I have these people that I work with for a long, long time <clears throat> and they get very used to my work and how I work. So... He was able to do kind of large prints for me. I, I do lots and lots of tests all the time um, for resolution and colour. Um, and then sometimes he actually has to kind of source it out to a, another print company if he can't get the, the intensity of colour. Or this one was particularly hard because I really wanted a sort of fluorescence and he couldn't actually print it. So we were trying uh, with another print company to print fluorescent, but then it was too too odd. And then we were printing on metallic paper and. So actually, there's quite a lot of sort of trials with everything, and um, then I know I know when it's right, and so the, it's a conforming vinyl um, which which is cast rather than rolled, and so with the cast vinyl when it's made, it's sort of flowed, and um, I'm not sure exactly the process, but um, it has less memory, and so it can conform over shapes mm. and and less likely to bounce back. And it's applied, and then so I have a special person to do that, and um, and then he uses heat to, to set it so that relaxes the, the vinyl. So it's kind of beautiful all the different processes, and then um, and then we have to for this work I had to set it up for for glass beading, and usually do the back first, so the the back edge is is glass beaded first, and then it takes three days for it to go off, and then the front is done. So it's a whole day of really intensive glass beading. I get all the bead from Germany, work in different sizes. So I'm quite particular too about what size glass bead is used. Um, this is very, very fine. So 0.8 to 1 mil beading, a glass bead in all individual spheres. And, and you uh, use a coat of re resin or glue, isn't it? Basically mm. you kind of coat the whole surface of the image. Mm -hmm. And then the glass beads go on top of that. That's right. So yeah, I have you know quite a few people, um, art students or in graduates and uh, musicians, all sorts of people um, come together. So this would have taken four, four to five or six people working on this, and um, so they have to keep. They actually have to work like an organism themselves, and 
um, not get territorial about where they're working. So um, to keep keep the whole thing fluid, so that the whole there's not kind of one patch that's different from anywhere else. So it's constantly herding that. So we've got all, we've worked out all this vocabulary, constantly herding the glass bead, um, and really just um, trying to mesh them as much as possible, so there are no gaps. Mm. And um, so then, yeah. So sometimes they can be working for ten hours and have chemical suits and respirators and things and it's a day when I have to look after them so I spend my day uh, feeding uh, mm -hmm. giving pieces of chocolate and things so that's kind of quite an amazing amazing thing but it's demanding for everybody yeah